your graciousness and for uh, inviting us here today to, to talk to you and to uh, really connect with our community. And so, uh, first off, I, I do want to say some thank yous. John asked me to do a few things here. Uh, this one's a little off script, but uh, uh, being that we're a little bit belated here, uh, I think it's key everyone understands right now, military, military service, we are a volunteer force. Uh, our, our force comes from people willingly, knowingly that step uh, into the uniform. Uh, it fills my hallways uh, with uh, operators that are of the highest skill that continue to step uh, into combat. Uh, and they do so as volunteers because of the people who have come before them and have set that reputation, have set those standards, have broken the trail uh, in, in front of us. And so at the uh, belated uh, Veterans Day, I know we have many veterans here. Thank you for your service. And thank you for your inspiration. Thank you. Um, <laughs> the additional things that uh, John asked me to come and do today, uh, one of which you know, I'm not, not as as comfortable with, but I will absolutely do it since the, the chief has, uh, has directed, uh, is to talk a little bit about myself. Uh, additionally, uh, to talk a little bit about uh, SEAL Team 1 uh, and what it is within the SEAL teams, and then a little bit at large about Naval Special Warfare as a community. Uh, and, and then afterwards, I'm happy to take some questions. Uh, I know that uh, you mentioned the, the key nuance of when we talk about Navy SEALs, we see a little bit of a shroud of secrecy a little bit of um, you know mysticism, uh, a little bit of uh, romanticism that creates movies and creates uh, books and creates TV shows that were all popular, but there's a difference between uh, Hollywood reality and, and what people put in fiction. So uh, I'm happy to discuss and, and to help answer some of the, the holes that, that people and the burning questions that people may have. But uh, first off, so how did I come to be here? Uh, so, as a commanding officer of SEAL Team 1, I, I serve uh, at the pleasure of being the 28th uh, commanding officer of SEAL Team 1. Uh, SEAL Team 1 was commissioned in uh, January 1st of 1962. Uh, believe it or not, everyone uh, you know, falsely accredits uh, uh, John F. Kennedy for commissioning of Naval Special Warfare and the SEAL Teams and Special Operations. It was actually accomplished under the previous president, under President Eisenhower, however it took effect. Uh, under the Kennedy administration and became famous during his speech at the Military Academy when he introduced an unconventional warfare and an unconventional enemy and the need for a military capability to rise to meet and to uh, defeat that unconventional enemy. Um, so SEAL Team 1 started in January of 1st of 1962 uh, with 50 enlisted service members and 10 officers. that were all volunteers that, uh, that came from the UDT teams, which were the predecessors, of the SEAL teams in order to really just figure it out, to go from their roots of uh, being uh, underwater demolition teams or uh, the frogmen of, of uh, World War II that swam across the beach uh, prior to invasions to make sure that the landing craft could get there safely. And they used to do so um, in nothing but UDT shorts, you know, a, a K-bar knife, a life vest, some fins, goggles, and a whole bunch of explosives. Uh, and they'd always, you know, have the, the the coup de grace of making sure that they planted some sort of sign that faced the, the, faced the water and let the Marines know that somebody else has been there before the Marines got on the beach. So, uh, uh, yeah, well, uh, that, that legacy has grown within the teams as well as is the proper amount of, pardon my French, a, a little shit talking that we do within, within the teams that helps, helps with the ego. So, so what brought me here, believe it or not, I'm a, I'm a city kid uh, from Long Island, New York. Um, and uh, to that point, uh, when it came to swimming in the ocean, uh, I honestly didn't know how to swim other than to get myself to the side of the pool uh, until I got to college. Uh, upon graduating from Villanova University, uh, I you know, found my way into the SEAL teams after some inspiration from a former high school uh, friend and alum, and then spending time with a roommate who was a All-American freestyler for Villanova University. And I was able to get selected straight into the SEAL teams. Um, I was commissioned in May and then showed up for uh, SEAL training in uh, July with the commencement of August 1st and was able to make it through BUDS training. Um, I have served at every SEAL team on the East Coast. Uh, for some of you that are giving those puzzling looks of how many SEAL teams are there, there are 10 SEAL teams. Uh, they are split between the East Coast and the West Coast. Uh, four on each coast or eight total are what we call traditional SEAL teams that focus on the mission sets of special reconnaissance, uh, direct action, 
uh, and uh, all of uh, some of the other nuanced uh, requirements and capabilities. Uh, the other two SEAL teams that are in that 10 total uh, provide us additional capabilities, technologies. Uh, they tend to be our Google enterprise, if you will, of the SEAL teams, and they uh, provide us everything from uh, military purpose canine capabilities to human collectors capabilities to uh, unmanned aerial platform capabilities. Uh, in addition to that, we have the community of Naval Special Warfare, which also includes um, the six plus thousand people that are support. A key nuance that, you know, within the difference between, uh, you know, most naval organizations, commands, and communities is our community is solely based on people. We don't have uh, aircraft, we do not, don't have ship, ships or major uh, satellite programs or missile programs. Uh, we, we are focused on, uh, you know, individuals with their capabilities uh, to be able to project uh, well into hard to reach, hard to access places uh, to carry out strategic objectives that, uh, in, in a small and surgical fashion. Um, so with that, we have the addition of three special boat teams, is what we call them. Um, they're uh, special warfare combat crewmen that go through a qualification course to get there as well. Uh, and they drive a whole bunch of different uh, mobility platforms, but small mobility platforms, everything from uh, a 12 passenger boat um, to you know, a four passenger vehicle. Uh, to whatever we need in order to get from one point into the area where we need to you know, conduct our actions on the objective. Um, in addition to that, we have an additional uh, team out in Honolulu, Hawaii, uh, that is uh, uh, the SEAL delivery team, which focuses on uh, underwater delivery uh, systems and technologies for swimmers and SEALs. And so that is just a, a quick thumbnail sketch of Naval Special Warfare. Of those, you know, 6,000, our, our community is just under 9,000 people. So with the 6,500 approximate that are um, support personnel or people of intelligence and, uh, you know, that conduct intelligence operations, administrative, uh, medical, uh, uh, logistics, all those different pieces, uh, we're only about 3,000 operators strong, so that's a pretty significant tail to tooth ratio when we look at the community. It's also a fairly small cross-section of the community, and it, everyone that talks about SEALs, SEALs being involved in different operations globally, um, we are, you know, uh, one small portion, you know, of about 10% of the overall special oper United States military special operations community. Um, so that's a good metric. So as we see all the different operations that we're involved in, currently we have SEALs uh, deployed into 24 different countries right now. Uh, we have Special Operations Forces deployed in about 72 different countries right now. Uh, the majority of those countries are all conflict zones. Um, special Operations, an additional metric for everyone's standard is uh, the NDAA for you know, the defense budget uh, last year was just south of $700 billion. Of that, approximately $7 billion goes towards special operations. And of that special operations, 1.8% uh, goes to the Navy SEALs. So uh, in terms of where we are as a small force and where we are in the world uh, conducting strategic you know, missions and mission sets, it's a, it's a pretty significant return on your investment. So from a, from a fiscally responsible perspective, I'll add that one out there. Yeah. Fine taxpayers uh, uh, as we have here today. Um, so after coming into the teams um, in uh, the late 90s, uh, prior to 9-11, uh, straight from uh, college, I went straight through SEAL training um, successfully, uh, which is a challenge uh, as we currently still, even back then and currently today, we still hover at a neighborhood of about 70 to 75 percent attrition uh, in the program. Um, that's an interesting metric and that's a, it becomes a very interesting elite kind of standard that is created from that. Uh, but that starts at when people show up to training. It leaves out a very large uh, pathway of people trying to get to training. So people going from boot camp, from you know, the Naval Academy, from commissioning sources, to how, how will they compete just to get one of those slots to show up day one, week one of a 27 week initial, you know, what we call basic underwater demolition SEAL training, uh, followed on by uh, SEAL qualification training, or SQT, which is an additional six months. 
Um, it currently takes uh, just about a year and a half to create a brand new United States Navy SEAL. As a, a commander of a SEAL team, I'm not part of that process. So I benefit and I just have SEALs that have just completed the training. They have gone through the attrition pathways, the selection processes, and they show up at a level of trust and a level of skill set that is a, is a standard that, you know, that we uh, use as our bare minimum. Uh, from which we then develop that seal to be an actual combat capability, to be a force multiplier, to be a operator that we can send into ambiguous environments um, with little to no resourcing or, uh, or, or backside and affect strategic and essential uh, outcomes. Um, and they, they do that whether they're 22 years old or whether they're 42 years old, we send our people into harm's way uh, on a daily basis to do so. Um, the people that we have at the teams go through a process to do so though. You know, so we have, once we have people that show up after the accession pipeline, we then take as an organization, as a SEAL team, um, we go through a several month period of what we call interdeployment training cycle or a workup uh, for anyone who's uh, spent time in the military. You do a workup before your deployment or a training and a readiness before you go and actually project forward. Ours is about 18 months long, um, but we are in a tank tread, believe it or not. And so what that means is I had previously mentioned uh, the five SEAL teams. Uh, you know, the five SEAL teams are split between the East Coast and the West Coast. Um, at any given time, there are uh, 365 days a year uh, seven days a week, we have uh, two SEAL teams that are forward deployed to all of the geographic component commanders, um, covering down on the requirements that those admirals, generals, uh, and strategic leaders have for special operations. So they do that in six month increment increments. So um, a SEAL team will start from a fresh start every two years. At the end of 18 months, it'll take the entire SEAL team will go overseas and cover down on multiple requirements in you know, anywhere from a fairly sizable number to a very small two-person, three-person kind of element to be able to, to make things happen. Uh, so every six months, those teams will rotate. However, they will maintain uh, a constant presence forward in those requirements. Uh, so at SEAL Team 1, we are in a stage now where um, I, I currently have uh, 322 people under my command right now. Um, of those 322 people, 146 are operators. Um, the remainder are support um, enablers, uh, combat service support, um, and people you know that uh, keep keep us keep us from you know uh, dragging our knuckles too too far and to our own detriment. So uh, that keep us as a fully functioning and synchronized organization. Um, by the time I deploy, I will end up deploying and uh, have command and control over approximately 375 to 385 people um, spread throughout um, two major geographic com uh, combatant commanders. So I will send forces to U.S. Pacific Command, and then I'll send forces to um, U.S. Central Command. Uh, in U.S. Central Command, several different locations um, throughout as well as um, I will uh, be a commander of a task force um, currently working the issues in Iraq, Syria, and the Levant um, for the special operations there. Um, and so the operators, as we come through that training cycle, they work you know, six months on professional development where it's individual schools, skills, um, you know, new specialized uh, you know, uh, skill sets that they bring as, uh, to the overarching organization. They work on some leave time and trying to uh, you know, make sure that they uh, uh, energize the most important uh, you know, resource and enabler that we have, which is the family, uh, that keeps us uh, you know, uh, pushing forward and being able to do what we do. Uh, then once we finish that six month period, we get together as units, as just SEALs, uh, and we focus on building our core competencies and our core skills. You know, we have to be brilliant in the basics of you know, from shooting to moving to communicating to all of those, um, you know, uh, unilateral and uh, very high-end uh, capabilities. And then we spend six months doing what we call integration. And the integration is we bring every asset, every resource, uh, every 
um, support personnel, every you know aviation platform to surface combatant uh, vessels to uh, three-letter agency organizations that provide us intel fusion uh, to the technologies, uh, and then we get everyone together working on a nice, well-oiled machine, and then we go overseas and we relieve the watch that is uh, currently standing in harm's way. Um, and, and that is the functionality of how Naval Special Warfare and the SEAL teams um, you know, uh, continue to, to maintain that presence overseas. Um, once I came in, and if you noticed, I said I didn't like talking about myself, so I keep kind of going back incrementally because it's, uh, uh, it's you know, not, not my forte of, of trying to speak about myself in the, in the background. I, I was fortunate enough I served on every one of those SEAL teams, um, all five on the, the East Coast uh, before coming out to the West Coast. Um, I did a tour in Afghanistan where I spent 12 months uh, in Afghanistan uh, working for uh, Major General Miller, then Major General Miller, now Lieutenant General Miller, and was responsible for 12,000 coalition special operations forces uh, throughout Afghanistan and 38,000 Afghan special operations partners um, that were functioning uh, within the Afghan uh, battle space. Um, and was given the option to choose which SEAL team to, to come to and which, which command uh, you know, I would have the honor of taking. And I absolutely, absolutely chose SEAL Team 1 being the first SEAL team, being the legacy that you know, formed you know, uh, uh, what has become the modern day SEAL teams. Um, we see other SEAL teams that are in the news very often and that make up the thrust of, you know, uh, of you know, what defines the SEAL teams, but in reality, they're a very young organization that was founded uh, in, in, in time, uh, in, in, in blood, uh, by SEAL Team 1 and SEAL Team 2, uh, which were commissioned in January 1st of 1962. A great nuance to that was I said that there was 50 enlisted uh, members and 10 officers that um, uh, formed that team. Uh, that team then later, believe it or not, after in uh, June, August of that year, deployed to then Vietnam and started working in advisory roles and capacities, uh, and before Christmas they had incurred their first casualty. So within an 11 month span, they had gone from a brand new command of just trying to figure it out to actually incurring combat loss and combat casualties. Uh, that legacy has grown um, to a point today where uh, coming into command at SEAL Team 1 has come with the, uh, an added nuance of I have a huge alumni network and so uh, I think the climates of uh, sunny Southern California and Coronado uh, have made some of the alumni, uh, you know, very have a, a, a degree of longevity. So they always show up at all the events to remind me, remind me of the legacy, and uh, to remind, remind me of the footprints that have come before to make sure that we're exceeding expectations that come with naval special warfare. Um, naval special warfare currently, um, as we deploy. Um, our operators are um, pushed into circumstances, and we've seen a lot of the news uh, with regards to unfortunate casualties and losses. Uh, we incur casualties and losses. There, um, there is a degree of significance to that because of how, uh, how small of units we are and how critical each, each operator and enabler is in that, that team. Um, the folks that come to me from that accession pathway and pro uh, program are probably of some of the most impressive caliber uh, and the screen process uh, that brings those people um, to you know the SEAL teams um, has not changed too much, believe it or not. Um, the big buds underwater demolition SEAL training, uh, once there was the recent uh, direction from the Secretary of Defense to integrate um, all uh, military uh, jobs and functions across the, the DOD to uh, be open to uh, all um, uh, all genders and backgrounds uh, and um, um, for all U.S. citizens to, to compete or participate in. They did a study in, and uh, looked at every single um, event that comes that was formed in 1962 and, and prior to in, in the 40s to help train up uh, SEALs and they actually validated some of those extremely hard and challenging practices against combat requirements and have they have stood the, the test of time and they've become the standards so the standards of people, you know, that that uh, that uh, uh, test and create a, you know, the um, the selection have not changed in decades, and uh, still produce some of the most impressive, uh, competent, and capable seals um, at the command 
and it's, it's definitely a humbling day to walk through the hallways of the command uh, and to work amongst and, and to be able to lead them um, as we go forward. Naval Special Warfare at large, um, we have over the past 10 years had to look at recouping our maritime legacy. We are the special operations component of the United States Navy. So uh, my boss's boss, uh, Admiral Zemanski, has, has two bosses. He reports to uh, the Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Richardson, uh, because we are a naval service component. We are the special operations component of the Navy. He also reports to uh, uh, General Thomas, who is the US Special Operations Commander, uh, the SOCOM Commander. Um, and so being that we are the naval and the maritime component of the Special Operations uh, Command as well. Um, so even we have the Marines and the MARSOC capabilities, however, Naval Special Warfare uh, maintains that dominant hat as the, uh, the naval and the maritime uh, component of Special Operations Forces globally. Um, so with that, as we expand, you know, uh, coming back from the desert and recouping some of our maritime skills, um, our, uh, our legacy of coming from the sea um, it has been reinstilled and reinvigorated, more so now in some of the challenging environments that we saw and you know, haven't seen really since the Cold War of near-peer adversaries with near-peer capabilities that tend to match us uh, and not be uh, some of the um, more mujahideen or freedom fighter or uh, insurgent capabilities which are lethal and evil. Um, and without ethical foundation in, in a lot of the practices and the, te the techniques that they use. Um, however, um, still a little bit in the, the um, binary stage, so um, being able to counter them has caused us uh, years of trying to relook into to reinvigorate our skill sets to be able to battle near peer competitors as we did during the Cold War. And now, as we see um, in you know the major nation standoff that, that we uh, support as the national uh, security policy and the, the national strategic military strategy uh, and the uh, defense military strategy. Um, it has become a challenge, but we still rise every day uh, and move forward to cover down both on the issues that we face within Iraq, within uh, Syria, within Somalia, within Sub-Saharan Africa and uh, East and West Africa, within Southeast Asia. Um, and at the same exact time, we still train to the level of being able to face uh, adversaries and uh, elbow matches where uh, subtle and uh, hard to access surgical capabilities are required in near peer environments um, from Asian countries to you know uh, European and Eastern European countries we still focus and fight uh, and face uh, uh, face the our abilities to, to be able to, to challenge uh, each, of, each of those actions and so um, with that, I think hopefully I've gotten to a point of maybe 20 minutes and being able to open it up to questions. Hopefully I saw some questions.